Okay, welcome back everybody. We're gonna get started with our next session, all uh, well, three McMaster speakers. Uh, and we're gonna start with Ms. Tyra Ritchie, who is a uh, distinguished alumna of our university. She completed her master's degree in Dr. Ali Ashkar's lab uh, in the McMaster Immunology Research Center. Uh, she focused on exploring the impact of oral cannabis consumption on early pregnancy and fetal development and has uh, since gone on to medical school at the University of Toronto. While uh, as a graduate student, she received a Women's Health Scholars Award funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, as well as a Canadian graduate scholarship. And uh, currently her interests uh, in and following medical school are around women's health. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Tyra Ritchie. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Tyra, and today I'm going to be presenting the work that was done in the majority of my master's project in Dr. Ali Ashkar's lab. And our research looks at investigating the effects of oral cannabis consumption on early pregnancy and beyond. So as we know, as from our talks earlier, that the use of cannabis in pregnancy has increased drastically in recent years especially following the 2018 legalization of recreational cannabis. As legalization seems to increase the potency of cannabis, the accessibility, as well as the positive perception surrounding cannabis use. And it appears that pregnant women are using cannabis to self-medicate nausea and vomiting symptoms. I have quite a few animations. <laughs> um, so it, despite this rising prevalence of cannabis use in pregnancy, there have been several studies that have underpinned the detrimental harm of in utero cannabis exposure on several pregnancy outcomes, such as low birth weight, preterm birth, stillbirth, as well as several neurocognitive impairments in the child later in life, such as increased anxiety, hyperactivity, aggression, and autism spectrum disorder. However, the evidence isn't clear cut as there is some conflicting data and there are quite a few questions that still remain. So one of those is do all cannabinoids affect pregnancy outcomes? So primarily the preclinical data looks at THC, the psychoactive component of cannabis. However, other prominent cannabinoids like CBD are largely unstudied. Um, the second question is, what is the effect of oral cannabis consumption on fetal development? As again, the majority of preclinical uh, research is focusing strictly on either an intraperitoneal injection of THC or um, on uh, cannabis smoke exposure. And additionally, these studies looking at humans who use cannabis in pregnancy don't tend to specify what the cannabis method of consumption is and also the type of cannabis. And the last question that also remains largely unanswered is what is the mechanism driving these cannabis-induced pregnancy complications as this is currently really unknown. So these three questions really guided my master's work which aimed to answer our central question is oral cannabis consumption of either CBD or THC causing pregnancy complications and leading to behavioral changes after birth. So my project had three key aims to determine whether oral consumption of either CBD or THC affects fetal growth, to assess whether cannabis exposure in utero leads to long-term cognitive behavioral changes after birth, and to explore how cannabis disrupts the maternal fetal interface earlier in pregnancy to tease a little bit about what might be happening causing these complications. And I'll first focus on the first aim, but I'll address all of them in today's talk. Okay, so for our experiments, we used a mouse model of pregnancy um, using CD57 black six mice. And how this worked was we would actually pair the mice, uh, the males and females in the evening, and the following morning check for the presence of a vaginal copulation plug. 
If a plug was present, these mice were deemed at gestation day 0.5. Then we started to administer the either the CBD, THC, or a control MCT oil starting at gestation day 6.5, which falls after implantation as we're not interested in looking at implantation. We then administered this uh, cannabis oil daily from gestation day 6.5 and then up to and including day 11.5 to mimic an exposure of early to mid pregnancy as typically cannabis use tends to fall uh, during the third trimester. And then we looked at uh, outcomes of pregnancy one day uh, prior to mouse term. And what we saw was that the mice that were exposed to THC oil significantly reduced the fetal birth weight um, in the mice, which corresponds to what's been found in other human studies and other preclinical research. However, while the weights weren't significantly different in the CBD group, there was a high degree of variability with some of the uh, fetuses being very small and other ones being normal. So we next quantified how many of the fetuses would be considered small for gestational age and fall below the 10th percentile of the control group. And what we saw was that actually both THC and CBD increased the uh, percentage of the fetuses being considered small for gestational age. Next, looking at the size of the fetuses, we also saw corresponding to the decrease in weight, THC also significantly decreases crown run length in the fetuses. Interestingly, we did see a decrease in the fetal head length in both the fetuses that were exposed to either THC or CBD oil during pregnancy. And again, other studies have found that in women who use cannabis in, during pregnancy, there is a uh, lower head circumference at birth. So ultimately what we're seeing is that THC oil decreases fetal weight, crown rump length, head size at term, and CBD oil also decreases fetal head size and also um, leads to a higher likelihood of being small for gestational age. So ultimately what we're seeing is that exposure to both THC and CBD oil uh, during pregnancy leads to adverse fetal development. And I next want to touch a little bit about the preliminary data we have so far, uh, looking at how cannabis exposure may be leading to long-term uh, cognitive and behavioral changes in the mice. So to do this, we used our same mouse model where the mice were exposed to either THC oil, CBD oil, or control oil from gestation day 6.5 to 11.5. But then this time we actually let the mice give birth and we followed the pups for eight weeks afterwards. After eight weeks, we performed a series of different tests to look at different behavioral changes and cognitive functioning. And for this experiment, we had the opportunity to use the IntelliCage system, which is really the future of behavioral assessments in animal models. It's a uh, self-sufficient cage that is hooked up to a computer and is able to perform a series of different behavioral uh, tasks and assessments um, with mice housed in a community environment. So there's up to 15 mice in the cage at once. And what's really interesting about this system is that the mice actually have an RFID tag injected onto their back so that the entire experiment can be done without any sort of uh, human manipulation or any sort of experimenter uh, interaction. So they're left in this cage um, for several days to weeks and the entire experiment's done in isolation. We also had the opportunity to put the mice into the me metabolic cage, which measures things like oxygen consumption, CO2 production, water, and food intake. Unfortunately, I don't have the data from this quite yet as the mice are just going through that now and the uh, males and females just came out a couple days ago. But what I can show you is that what we're seeing is that interestingly, while all the mice that appeared pregnant at day 11.5 in the control and CBD group had pups at term, it appears that only two out of the five of the moms that appeared pregnant at day 11.5 actually had pups at birth at term. And we also tracked the fetal weight, the pup weight over the first eight weeks of birth. And looking what we saw as an overall trend for a lower weight in the mice that were exposed to CBD and THC in utero.
and it's much more striking in the females than the males. So, so far we have been able to look at just the open field testing, and this is particularly shown in the males. Um, and what we actually saw was that in the mice that were exposed to THC in utero, they had a significant increase in this rearing behavior, which is when the mice stand on their back legs and try to explore around the cage. And typically an increase in rearing behavior indicates more exploratory um, behavior. And just in general, when watching these mice, they were much more active and would run around the cage. Um, so hopefully the uh, IntelliCage um, tells us a bit more about that. But all the other parameters in the open field test didn't appear that there was any clear trends into things that were different between the THC, CBD, and control mice. Um, so this is all the data I have from the behavioral side of things right now, but there's quite more that we need to do on this and some preliminary um, evidence is looking quite interesting. So lastly, I just want to switch gears and go to the other arm of this project, which is looking earlier in pregnancy to see how cannabis may be affecting the maternal fetal interface and potentially leading to these abnormal fetal outcomes that we're seeing. So again, we used our same mouse model. The mice were receiving cannabis oil from gestation day 6.5 to 11.5, but this time we stopped the experiment earlier at gestation day 12.5, and we looked at the maternal fetal interface um, uh, via histology. And what we found is that interestingly, the mice exposed to CBD oil in pregnancy had a significantly smaller uh, placental area and then looking at the maternal side of things, so the decidua is that maternal aspect to the maternal fetal interface. And typically at gestation day 12.5 in mice, the decidua has less cell density. It's more populated by these large, um, thinly walled uh, vessels. But what's interesting is that in the CBD mice, there was a much higher density of cells populating the decidua, which is again, abnormal for this time point. So we wanted to go a little bit further and try and tease out what cells are populating the decidua at this time point. And one of the most prominent cells is an actually a, a specific type of immune cell called a natural uh, killer cell. So to see if that's what was populating the decidua, we performed a, spe a specific immunofluorescent stain, which uh, specifically targets uterine NK cells. And when quantifying fluorescence, we found that there was a significant elevated fluorescence in the decidua of the mice exposed to CBD, indicating that there was more uterine NK cells populating the decidua. So uterine NK cells are a major player in early pregnancy remodeling. So they're heavily involved in regulating trophoblast migration to help form the placenta. They're also involved in immune suppression. So they help to prevent um, uh, recognition of the uh, semi-foreign fetal cells by the maternal immune system. And they're also extremely important in vascular remodeling, which is the creation of these low resistance, thinly walled, dilated vessels. So we wondered, is cannabis disrupting um, uterine NK cell function in early pregnancy? And we first looked at the vascular remodeling process. And what we found is that when looking at the thickness of the vessel walls, the mice that were exposed to CBD or THC had significantly thicker spiral arteries located in their decidua, indicative of poor vascular remodeling. Visibly, when looking at the arteries, they were also much more circula circular, which um, means they're also less developed as they typically should elongate. So the main mechanism through which uterine NK cells regulate vascular remodeling in the mouse is via the production of interferon gamma. And previous reports have actually found that THC into somewhat uh, CBD can suppress interferon gamma suppression in immune cells found in the blood. So we wondered if cannabinoids may be affecting uterine and K cell production of interferon gamma similarly and ultimately leading to this abnormal vascular remodeling that we're seeing. So to do this, we took the implantation sites from healthy mouse pregnancy and isolated the uterine and K cells. We incubated the uterine and K cells with either THC or CBD and looked at the expression of interferon gamma. 
And what we found was that THC significantly decreased interferon gamma expression in the uterine NK cells. However, there seemed to be an opposite trend with CBD. So while it may be uh, THC is mediating this poor vascular remodeling by inhibiting interferon gamma, it might be through a different mechanism in regards to CBD. And just to touch briefly on the human side of this project, our lab has a model of uterine NK cells that we in vitro generate from just healthy blood NK cells. So we isolate the blood NK cells and then incubate them in a hypoxia with a series of different cytokines that can create them to becoming this uterine NK cell-like cell. So we took these cells and incubated them with either THC and CBD and looked at the expression of VEGF which is another angiogenic factor that acts like interferon gamma, but tends to be more prominent in uh, human pregnancy. And what we found was, again, it appears that THC reduces VEGF production in these uterine NK cell-like cells, but the effect of CBD is a bit less clear. So ultimately, to summarize what we found so far in the Ashkar lab, is that THC oil consumption from early to mid-pregnancy seems to reduce spiral artery remodeling, which may be driven through impaired interferon gamma production through uterine NK cells. And ultimately, this poor vascular remodeling may then not be able to accommodate for the extensive growth demands of late stage pregnancy and lead to this abnormal fetal outcomes we see, like the reduced birth weight, reduced fetal length, redu uh, reduced head size. And we're also maybe seeing some behavioral changes, but again, it's very preliminary at this stage. On the CBD side of things, it also seems to be disrupting dis uh, vascular remodeling, but potentially through a different mechanism, as it appears that CBD is uh, increasing interferon gamma production. It's also increasing uterine and K-cell number, and there seems to be a little bit of placental abnormalities with the CBD. Ultimately, it's also leading to a reduction in head size and also increasing the number of fetuses being small for gestational age. So ultimately what we're seeing is that either uh, oral consumption of CBD or THC oil is leading to abnormal fetal outcomes. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and thank my supervisor, Dr. Ali Ashkar, um, and specifically my lab members, Emily Fang and Dr. Leila Vahedi, who have been really helpful with the behavioral experiments um, and our collaborators. I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Dan Hardy. Very nice presentation. <clears throat> the effect on, was it, was it THC decreased VEGF in, <laughs> or, was it, or was it CBD? THC? THC, yes. That's remarkable because um, I know in my previous talk, we, I was telling you about um, offspring exposed to THC in utero, long-term impaired angiogenesis in the ovary. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to wonder if THC is having a widespread effect on VEGF and angiogenesis in multiple organs. So it's really fascinating to see this. So mm -hmm. it's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations, really thank exciting you. work. Um, I just wanna know if you have any comment about uh, the trophoblast remodeling, remodeling in the VEGF, and if there's any role you think for aspirin, because we now give women who are at high risk for placental dysfunction, trophoblast um, dysfunction, we thought it, we think is part of that. We give them aspirin now in pregnancy from weeks 12 to 16 is the ideal time to start. Um, have you given anything, uh, any thought about that or read anything about that in terms of a rescue effect? No, I haven't looked at that. We haven't really looked at any sort of rescuing or treatment whatsoever, but that's, it's interesting. Um, we do want to look more into the interaction with the uterine NK cells and the trophoblasts. Is there's, there is definitely crosstalk there, um, but we haven't looked any particularly at that. Yeah, you might think yeah. of giving them, giving them aspirin at that time that right. corresponds with the human 12 to 16 weeks. That's in yes. our guidelines now. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.